Good evening and welcome everyone to this webinar on Focus on Reading. I'm Matt Scott. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum, Assessment and Professional Development for the Kennewick School District. Tonight's webinar is one of a series of webinars entitled Get to Know Kennewick Schools. This is our seventh webinar of the school year and we're hosting these monthly sessions to inform our community about the different ways that we're supporting student success. The development of literacy skills, of the literacy skills of reading, writing, and listening are crucial for students as they progress through their school experience. Tonight's webinar is intended to provide our parents and community members with a greater understanding of literacy instruction, the district's literacy instructional model, what we do when students struggle in the development of literacy skills, and most importantly, how you can support your child in the development of literacy skills and an enjoyment of reading at home. This webinar will be posted to our website in the coming days for community members who may have, who may not have had the opportunity to participate live. Previous webinars in the Get to Know Kennewick Schools series can also be accessed at the KSD website. We are providing live translation and interpretive services for this webinar and want to welcome our families who speak Spanish. If you need Spanish translation, please select the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and you will be connected. There'll be time for questions at the end of the presentation. You may enter your questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom. For those of you who speak Spanish, your interpreter will translate your questions to the presenters. If you have questions for us on topics other than reading, we encourage you to email the KSD and we will respond. Tonight's Q&A moderator will be Robin Chastain, Executive Director of Communications and Community Education. At the end of the presentation, Robin will read the questions you've submitted to the presenters. I would like to introduce the presenter for tonight's program. Liz Dale is our English Language Arts and Social Studies Coordinator. Liz is an experienced teacher, reading specialist, and has been instrumental in the development of our district's literacy plan and all things reading and writing in the district. With that, I'll turn it over to Liz Dale. Okay, thank you, Matt. Hi, everyone. I uh, have just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm an Eastern Washington graduate with a reading major um, and a state reading endorsement, national board certified in early and middle childhood literacy. I joined the KSD a few minutes ago in 1987. Uh, my first full-time job was at Hawthorne Elementary. I've taught second grade, fourth grade. I've been a reading specialist in two schools, Westgate and Hawthorne. Um, and I'm finishing my ninth year here as the district K-12 literacy coordinator. Um, I also am responsible for social studies, uh, history, and world languages. I coordinate all efforts that uh, go into those content areas as well. I'm a lifelong Tricidian and raised two kids who were KSD um, uh, products. So um, very uh, comfortable and very familiar with the district having been here for quite a while. Um, some of the areas of my responsibility are uh, to provide support for our schools for to both administration and teaching um, uh, to help them operate within the framework of our literacy plans. Um, there's a lot of compliance that we need to be with, um, whether that be our local school board mandates, um, state and national requirements and so on. So there's just a lot of tracking that goes into uh, what we do. Um, I'm also uh, coordinating curricular material adoptions and implementations. This year, I have been coordinating uh, grade six through 12 um, ELA adoption, and um, that's been quite exciting. Um, I do a lot of professional development. I do a lot of in-building coaching workshops. I work, work with cadres in the middle schools uh, with the LA teachers, uh, collaborate with uh, other curriculum department personnel. I've been teaming with our math and science specialists a lot, doing STEM workshops, um, just taking care of day-to-day -day needs of re uh, administrators, reading specialists, classroom teachers. I also am a community li liaison and I work with uh, organizations such as the Mid-Columbia Reading Foundation and, and um, groups like that. And this last year, I've had the pleasure of getting myself up to speed on all things technology and um, have been helped you know, trying to be the best help I can be to help uh, teachers deliver students uh, lessons asynchronously and synchronously alike. So, um, so that's a little bit about me and what I do. So I just want to take an opportunity really fast to thank you for being here with us tonight. 
Um, and just to say that we would really like to take all the credit for your child's success, but the reality is parent involvement is the number one predictor of early literacy success and future academic achievement. So we thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Okay, so the purpose of tonight's um, uh, workshop is we're going to explore what we mean when we say literacy. We're going to take a look at our literacy model kind of at a glance. Um, learn uh, an overview of how students are screened for individual instruction and maybe reading difficulties such as dyslexia. And then the big thing is I'm going to be providing you with some evidence based resources and activities for helping your children develop their skills and have an enjoyment of reading at home. So what we mean when we say literacy, sometimes we interchange the word literacy and reading and um, literacy is just a little bit more. Here's one component. Um, and this is a model that we use in the district that really helps us understand how much goes into uh, this concept of reading. So you can see this rope, this is called Scarborough's rope. And um, it was, uh, created by a researcher several years ago to help teachers understand all the different nuances of, of reading. So you can see here that there's a red section that's called language comprehension and then a word, recogni word recognition uh, section that's blue coded. And um, these things go together to make skilled reading. So if you take a look at the top part, language comprehension encompasses all those things like background knowledge. How much do we bring to a text to help us understand it? Do we know a little bit about the rainforest so that when we read a text about the rainforest, we can make meaning of that? Do we have the vocabulary to read that and understand it? What are the language structures? So we have, um, we have similes and metaphors and do we understand what those mean? Uh, verbal reasonings and literacy knowledge. So, so do we understand that print goes from left to right? And do we understand the idea that uh, fiction is different than nonfiction? So there's just a lot that goes into the idea of reading comprehension. So then we times that by this idea of word recognition. So sometimes we um, sort of say that's phonics. Well, it's it is phonics, but it's a little bit more than that. There's an, uh, a component of literacy called phono uh, phonological awareness. And that is, um, can I put together and take apart different sounds, syllables, um, parts of words? Do I, um, can I manipulate those and interchange different letters and sounds and make a new word? So that's a really important skill. Then there is decoding. We know that we do need to, uh, our, we do need our students to know that um, M says M and that it's gonna blend with other letters and make words. And then we also have sight words. So um, we, we have all of that word recognition, word recognition skill and then the language comprehension skills and those all weave into skilled reading. But that's not all that reading, or excuse me, that's not all that literacy is. There's more. So there's also writing. So if you see over here, we have another rope, another model. And so we have this idea of composition on the top. So if you take a look here, this is when our students are actually um, sitting down and they're thinking about writing a, a piece uh, either in response to something they've read or they're creating something brand new. So they're thinking about the words that they're gonna choose and the sentences they're going to write. And they're going to go through a process where they have a draft and then they revise and they edit and then they publish. Um, so there's that piece of the composition. And then there's this whole idea of transcription, which is how do I spell? Am I, am I able to use my phonics the right way to, um, to make sure that my, my words are, are readable? Um, my handwriting, is it, is it readable? And then punctuation, am I using punctuation in order to tell the story the right way? And then we also have this idea of speaking and listening. I think Matt alluded to that a little bit earlier. So speaking and listening also um, goes into that literacy basket. So we have reading, writing, speaking, listening, and um, they all weave together. And we don't do these things um, in isolation. We do them um, 
um, collaboratively and um, across a day when we are doing social studies and science and math, and not just during our reading block time. Um, but, but that is what we are talking about when we talk literacy. Okay. So in our school district, our school board has mandated that every elementary student have a minimum of a two hour literacy block. This really ensures that we can do um, that we can do the uh, the best job for our students. It's the most important um, uh, foundation that we can provide them is for for our students to be competent readers. So two hour literacy block um, that does not include high school. In middle school, the kids will be they'll they'll typically have um, two, sometimes maybe even three periods where they attend um, an ELA block and they'll have like uh, a reading emphasis one hour and a writing emphasis another. But at elementary, um, we do it a little bit differently. We have one hour, um, and this varies a little bit at each school, just depending on resources, but a one hour of on grade level instruction. So that means all the students in the um, class are getting the same instruction whole group. That's everybody getting everything um, and um, on grade level material. So that's really important to us that our students have access to on grade level material. Then there's another hour where those students are getting at grade level instruction. That's our small group time. And in your, uh, if you have an elementary child, that time might be called walk to read or book club time. Um, I think different schools call it different things, but that's where we can really individualize and specialize our instruction to meet the needs of our students. Okay. We use an abundance of, um, of screeners very systematically to inform us of the exact literacy assets and deficits our students have and then instruct them accordingly. I'm gonna show you, um, excuse me. I'm gonna show you, uh, this is a plan. This is an, an example of one of our um, uh, assessments uh, schematics for second grade, and you don't need to know anything about this except this one key thing. On this chart, this flow chart, there are six separate screeners that we use. So we use MAP, we use Dibbles, we use um, uh, a core phonics uh, screener, we use a phonological awareness screener. If our students are second language students, we use ALPA or WIDA. Um, and and so there are, there's just a lot of drilling down that we do. And, um, and this assures us for that second hour of literacy instruction that we are um, providing the most appropriate instruction for our students. We go by a plan that looks kind of like this. Um, and we can um, take a look and we can say, okay, for our, for our students, if they are grouped into small groups, you know, we will we'll, we will be doing the MAP test a, a certain time of year. We'll be doing our doubles testing a certain time of year. The core phonics survey, if a student needs it, uh, phonological awareness screener as needed. We they're all going to do their curriculum based assessments, and then what the possible skill deficits be, and then how we can address those. So all of this to say, it's very systematic. It's very um, it's very specific and um, and we just want you to have that assurance that we um, pretty much know everything there is to know about your students in terms of their literacy um, assets and deficits. Okay, this is our curriculum. Um, so we have uh, a program called Journeys for our um, for our elementary students. And we just adopted for grade six or 11, a new program called Study Sync that we're pretty excited about. Um, we use the same curriculum across the district for really specific reasons. So all of our schools will have the same um, programs. First, if our students move from school to school, we want them to be able to be familiar with the materials. And then second, it gives us a better opportunity to collaborate with 
um, other schools. Um, we get together across the district often for trainings. And so it just, you know, really makes it a lot easier um, to do that. Um, our core reading programs are, are evidence-based. They have a very specific scope and sequence that makes sure that we're covering all the skills and strategies so that none are missed. They're all based on the, the learning standards, the Washington State learning standards, which are common core. Um, they use explicit instruction. And um, in the earlier grades, they include decodable text so that we provide our students with a really strong uh, phonics base. Okay. So we have advocated the Read 20 Minutes a Day initiative for many years, and it's really kind of come become part of our identity. So now I'm going to go from that um, that uh, minutia kind of thing into some uh, practical tips and ideas on how to maximize reading time with your child. I'm going to give you five big ideas. Here we go. Okay. The first one is to provide structure. So schedule uninterrupted time for reading daily, provide time, a comfortable space, and a consistent procedure. This is really important. Your child craves your attention. So make this time about reading and then allow other times of the day to be about other things like homework and, um, and chores and other activities, playing games and all that. But make sure you have um, some sort of structure in place so that this happens at least five days a week. That's really, that's really um, kind of a minimum standard that we, we would really like um, with that read 20 minutes. The next idea is text selection. So um, choose books and articles that match your child's interests, read several texts on the same topic, increase text length and difficulty as your child builds reading skills. So when you read um, texts that are on the same topic, your child develops what we call background knowledge. So um, they can take that knowledge then to the next text and the next text that are, that are on the same topic. As your child builds their independent reading skills, have them read longer passages to build stamina. You'll be able to recognize text becoming more complex by noticing longer words, new vocabulary, longer sentences, and advanced concepts. Read to your child to model the sound of fluent reading. That's really important that they, that they are hearing you model that. So here's what I mean by paired text. So you'll see these two, um, these two books are both about space. Um, one of the literacy practices that our students will do during literacy block in their whole group time um, is they're gonna read what we call paired text. So in Journeys and, and in our Study Sync um, materials, our new ones, um, we have two stories that are based on the same topic or theme. Um, the texts are related by by those themes and often we have students do some things with those like compare and contrast the text and then they'll write us write to a specific prompt um, that ties those two texts together. One of the things that we look for in paired text is one that has a really foundational set of vocabulary um, that will support then subsequent text. So we want to start with something that's really basic. So if I wanted to read the the book on uh, Carl Sagan to my child, it would probably be a wise thing to start with a book like this one on the left called Space, which is really a very, um, again, a very foundational kind of text about the solar system. Um, then when we go to read about Carl Sagan and Mysteries of the Cosmos, um, we already have that background knowledge or that schema, we call it, about the solar system, the space, what he was studying, what he was looking for. And our brain does this really cool thing. Um, they connect those thoughts and ideas together and it creates new learning. So then when another subsequent text is read about space, then connections are made back to both of those other texts. And it really builds um, our, our kids' um, background knowledge and, and just their overall knowledge and um, makes them feel comp like competent experts. 
Um, getting this is a quote by Dr. Richard Allington. We had the pleasure. I took some reading specialists to see him a couple of years ago, and one of the things he told us was that there had been some recent research on getting kids hooked on a literary series. So, for example, Harry Potter, Ginny B. Jones, Magic Treehouse. Um, so, and that is one of the best things you can do to increase their love of reading and in turn their reading ability. And we have just seen a plethora of book series come. And I, I have to thank the Harry Potter series. I think that was the thing that got us going on this, but there are all kinds. And um, I'm gonna show you a resource for um, looking at ideas for selecting text in just a minute. But um, I think that um, these are some that you might be aware of or might not be aware of. Sometimes we think of them as being all fantasy, but they're not necessarily. Um, so for example, the baseball card adventures, that was something that my son was really into. Honus and me, Jackie and me, Babe and me, they're about ba uh, baseball cards, um, baseball players whose cards are have a magical quality to them. and. Um, and they're very, they're, they're really great historical um, fiction. Uh, um, Mercy Watson is about a, a pig that um, lives the life of a child. Um, the Geronimo Stilton books, they're very popular. I, the I Survived, um, though, that's a really great one. Um, that's about uh, real events and history written in a fictional way. But the idea is that if we can get one or two of these books in our kids' hands and get them excited about them, then they'll want to reach for more. And I know with these series that I'm showing you here, there are many, many more books to reach for. So um, the options are, are kind of endless. Um, here is, and this uh, presentation is going to be uh, published on the KC website, I think tomorrow. The, here are some um, uh, websites that I recommend you go to when you're looking for specific book titles. You can uh, also use uh, Google, right? So um, that's a really that's a really good one too. Um, I like I like to use Google, but I think that um, the best children's books that site has been created by former teachers who know kids really well. And uh, I really like that one a lot. We Are Bookish is really great. Brightly is one that when you, um, kids can sort of um, uh, catalog their reading selections. And the more they catalog, the more suggestions come of books like the books that they're, they've read. So um, they're all just a little bit different, but, um, but very exciting. Really great resources. So idea number three is to be a partner. So read aloud and think aloud with your child, take turns reading parts of a text, reread and listen to your child read. Um, I think that um, when modeling, uh, reading, when you're doing the modeling, you, you're gonna wanna think out loud um, and ask yourself a question while you're reading. You, 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 know, you almost get to be a little bit of an actress, right? Or an actor um, and you can just stop at some point and say, I wonder what's going to happen next. Um, and then visualize or try to paint a picture of what's going on in the story. I can just see in my head that this is happening. Um, you're gonna want to decode or sound out a word and define it. So if you come across the word unstable, for example, um, you can go on to explain, you know, you could ask first, you know what that means? And if they know that what that means, then you can just move on. But if they don't, then you can give some uh, ideas and. Uh, um, options of things that are unstable or unsteady. Um, intentionally give your kiddo uh, parts of a book that they can read independently, and then make sure to talk about what's being read. Um, this is something that I really love. Um, and if you haven't explored this as a family, this would be really great. Reading wordless books is more intuitive than you think. There are so many. I've got some examples here. Journey is part of a series with Quest, and um, I think the last one is called Reach. Uh, beautiful, beautifully illustrated, um, as is Tuesday. Good Dog Carl is one from my kids' um, childhood that we used to read a lot about a big um, Rottweiler who was a babysitter um, and had lots of uh, adventures. 
Um, but when you share a workbook book with your child, you discover it together. You are creating the story. As you begin to always to read, you're going to want to always ask, what do you see? And then what else do you see? Ask along the way, how do you think the characters are feeling? How do you know? What are the clues? Your kids then become active partners with you instead of passive listeners. Um, give the story over to your child sometimes and let them narrate what's going on. At moments of conflict in the book, uh, which happens often even in wordless books, you can ask, what would you do? Um, but just remember that this is a pretty special experience and one that shouldn't be rushed. Um, the great thing about this is that every time you come to a wordless book um, at the very beginning, you're retelling the story in a, in a different way. It, it becomes a different story each time. So I really love this idea of sharing wordless books. Okay, idea number four is support accurate word reading. Now, we're not asking you to be reading teachers, but if you could focus on the words being read um, to correct reading mistakes, that would be great. Help your child pay attention to letter sounds, word parts, and blending letter sounds to read words correctly. This is kind of a, um, this is kind of a great thing to do. Listen carefully for your child's uh, misreads if they have any and you might be again to hear patterns uh, of misreadings for maybe the same vowel sounds for example um, you can have kids uh, pull parts uh, pull words apart and then put them back together sound them out um, if they're misreading the word ship and it should be chip you can say okay let's stop uh, what does ch say and if they if they forget you can um, you can replace that for them. Um, and there, there's just a lot you can do to help support them. We don't want them to get into the habit, uh, the bad habit of not reading correctly. This is really important. I've provided a link um, on this slide, um, and I'd like you to see this, um, this document. going to come up here. It is called Decoding Tips for Parents. I'm not going to go through all of it with you, but one of the things that I love about this is it goes over five common errors. Um, guessing a word based on the beginning or the ending letter sound is this first example. And then there's a whole protocol. So here's what you do. So for example, if, this, if your child reads the word wait as went, then you're going to uh, you're going to help them break it apart. And it shows you a model of how to do that, how to emphasize the vowel sound, blend it back together, read the word again smoothly, and then reread the whole phrase. So I really like this um, as a resource for you to use, uh, especially with beginning readers. And then idea five is emphasize meeting. So Encourage thought and discussion before, during, and after reading. Ask your child questions about word meanings and details of the text and help your child visualize the story. Um, one of the things that we know through research is that if a child can read about something and speak about something, they can write about it. So we really want to fill their buckets up with, um, with text and conversation. And then that really helps um, transfer over to proficiency in writing. Um, so, so that is a really great idea. I'm gonna give you some uh, thoughts here. One of the things that um, is kind of important to know is the difference between reading fiction and nonfiction. So um, fiction, which is those make-believe stories, um, has a distinct predictable pattern that is very sequential in nature. Um, there's a, a beginning, a very definite beginning, a middle, and an end. Nonfiction or informational text is usually written by an author for five different reasons only. Um, one of them is for um, cause and effect. So, uh, for example, in a biography, a person is having a troubled beginning but overcomes uh, a difficulty in a productive way. So that's cause and effect. Compare and contrast would be a book, for example, about um, animals in the wild and their teeth. You know, uh, 
um, an elephant is going to have different teeth than a tiger is than a monkey. And, um, and they're all they're all different, but they're all teeth. Uh, problem and Solution is a book about environmental problem, maybe um, solved by some uh, some research, some some science that comes along and helps to solve that. Um, that's a very specific reason why an author would write a story. A sequence story is really um, there's a lot of different types of sequences. There's some that are um, like a diary uh, of sorts, like a historical diary that might tell the story of. Um, some kind of a rescue and here's what happened on this day and the next day and the next day. Or it could be a set of directions or a recipe. Um, but anything that goes in a particular order um, is a sequence. And then a simple description book um, would be just like that one that I shared a little earlier about the solar system. Um, just what it is and all the basic vocabulary that goes with it. So. I'm going to just um, talk real quick about this book. I don't know how many of you would be familiar with this book. It's called The Day the Crayons Quit. And so I'm going to model how we would, um, how, how a good way for you to um, find out if your child understands all the elements of fiction. So this is a book that, um, uh, that is about um, a box of crayons and a boy who owns them. And the crayons are really crabby because they are feeling very overused and um, overutilized and worn out. And they're trying to jockey for who's the favorite um, and so on. So um, at the end of the story, uh, what happens, how it resolves is that um, the boy who owns them uses all the colors equally to draw a picture and they're all very pleased with themselves and he's pleased with them and it, it all resolves itself very nicely. Um, and, and so this is the strategy that I would use to, um, that I would use to determine if my kiddo had um, all of the essential elements of this story. And we call this the five finger summary um, and it involves five words, somebody wanted, but so, and then. So in this story, the somebody was the crayons and it could also be the boy and that would not be wrong. There's no wrong in that. Um, somebody wanted, um, they had an argument about which one of them was the most popular and thus overused um, and they wanted a break, uh, but Duncan liked them all and wanted them to all be happy. So Duncan colored a picture using all the crayon colors. Then his teacher thought he was very clever and all the crayons were finally happy. So somebody wanted, but so then. That's a really, um, a really fun thing to do at the end of reading a fiction story. Um, and, um, and the thing that is really kind of magical about this little strategy is that if your, if your child can tell you this out loud again, they can transfer that um, reading and speaking to being able to write a summary. And that's really a very important skill for our kids to have in school. Okay, here are some things that, some questions that you would want to ask um, about a nonfiction text, text that you're reading. So um, because it's not sequential and uh, beginning, middle, end, it's gonna be a little different. So. One of the things you might want to start with is what surprised me, um, and and you know you can say you know what were you shocked about or what were you surprised to learn, um, what did you never think or what could you not believe, and that um, and those are all um, really good things and that really helps you too get to learn uh, what your child um, is excited about when when they're reading. What did the author think I already knew? That's a, that's a really good one. Um, you know, I did not know, I was confused by, the author assumed. A lot of times authors don't give us everything and sometimes we have to continue to um, go to other resources and find those things. We might not know that your child might, not, might have that gap and so it'd be a really great thing to ask. Um, the author thought I knew something, but gosh, I don't, so let's go find out. Um, and then what challenge changed or confirmed what I knew? So it might be something like, well, at first I thought, but now I've kind of changed my mind or I've had to rethink my 
my views or I understand change or I was right or wrong about or you know what would happen if um, what would have happened if that um, that uh, big ship did not get rescued from that ice ice block you know what would have happened to all the people on board um, so so these are just some different things that you can use to sort of probe understanding when you're finished reading nonfiction. Okay, so text is really everywhere. And I just want you to um, sort of expand your mind about what you uh, know or believe text to be about. Um, we like to use different kinds of texts in a school because it makes it fun for us. We get away from um, having our nose on a book sometimes and we take a look at art or photographs. Um, charts and graphs are very readable, right? Um, and that ties in with math, um, drawing signs and so on. I remember when my son was really small and there used to be price chopper stores here in town and we got out of the car. One time I took him out of his car seat and he pointed up at the sign and he said, P. And I was like, yes, that is a P. So he was reading that sign and knew we were at Price Chopper. So um, pay attention and have your kids start paying attention as well. Um, this is a photograph that I found that I really love. Um, I think it's a, I think um, if you can be on the lookout for, um, for photos and, you know, with Instagram and Google and Twitter, and uh, there's just, there's so much good, uh, conversation uh, photography out there right now. Um, but some questions you might want to ask is, you know, what's the first thing you notice about this photograph? Well, you know, it looks like a woman might be going into space and all of the guys are staying behind or maybe she's just come in. You know, we don't we don't really know without the text there. Um, what do you think they're talking about? She has a smile on her face, so it looks like things went well. Do we know for sure? No, but we could we can kind of surmise or read her face. Um, can you see yourself in the same place as these astronauts doing the same thing? Um, and then what do you not see here? Well, we don't see exactly where they are or um, any, we don't see what they uh, maybe have to eat for dinner that night. There's a lot of things we don't see, but you can spend a lot of time having conversations about, about um, good pictures like this and it's just a lot of fun. Um, and don't forget to incorporate math. When you're reading with your kids, one of the easiest things to do is counting. Um, how many trees are on this page? How many planets do you see in the solar system? And you can count them. It's just really great practice and it gets it away from the mundane, just, you know, just practicing, but um, that's a really fun thing to do. Uh, it's really important to, to do things that are different and the same. So which, which things belong in this set and which things belong in a, in a set that's all the same. Um, so, so those are really great things. And then make sure to point out references to times, dates, temperatures, and money. Those are all things that are often incorporated. Um, and I think, our, I think we feel like math belongs in a separate spot, but it's all very integrated. That is the end of my, um, my talk tonight, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have at this time. Okay, this is Robin Chastain, the Director of Communications. I'm going to facilitate the question and answer period. And so I will direct the questions at you, Liz. Um, so the first question we have is, what should I do if I notice my preschool child or my kindergarten child is having difficulty learning the names of the letters? Okay, okay. Well, that's a really good question that uh, parents have often. Um, and believe it or not, it's, it's the actual letter naming does not appear to be an indicator of reading success or failure. Um, we do eventually want them to, to know all the letters for sure. Um, a lot of that is developmental. So that, that is going to come along. Um, preschool, you know, four or five year olds will, they will eventually get all those letters. Once they get into school, we will screen them and what we really want to, we will screen for, do they know the names of the letters? And if not, we'll work on those. Um, at home, you can support that learning by, um, I would say going first to the letters in their name their first name first and then their last name, maybe 
the letters in the name of a pet, maybe the letters in the name of a favorite cousin, um, and just and just really um, trying to take some pressure off. There's some really great, you know, like letter magnets on the fridge is always a great thing. Um, again, just pointing out, you know, when you're at the when you're out and about, if you see the M at McDonald's, you know, what is that letter um, and, and so on. Once, uh, once we get past letter naming, we're really most interested in letter sounds. So, um, so letter sounds, knowing letter sounds is a, a broader indicator uh, of reading success. And so, um, so that, will, that will come too, but um, just, just try to make it as fun as you can and as relatable as you can to their lives. The next question is, what is Kennewick School District doing to shift towards the science of reading? Ooh, that's a good one. Well, if you saw the Scars Girl rope, um, you will you'll have seen um, that we that's the model that we are ascribing to. And what that is, it's the simple view of reading, which is language development times word recognition equals reading. Um, we are um, you know, we follow the RTI model, which um, I didn't call it that, but the the one hour of whole group was one uh, on level versus one hour of at level uh, reading that's very um, prescribed and targeted. Um, we make sure when we do all those screenings that I showed, we make sure that we, um, wherever a student's very bottom skill is, is that we begin to address that first. So we are paying very close attention to phonological awareness. So we just um, adopted a new um, uh, phonological awareness curriculum that's very robust. Uh, for our kinders and first graders and some second graders use it. Um, we're finding that um, that that's something that's really, um, that was something that needed to be beefed up. And um, we were seeing some really big success with that last year before we all dismissed to our homes. Uh, but we've been able to keep up with that uh, via our virtual learning and even videos from um, from that. Um, but we do, we do have, um, 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 a reading philosophy for our general ed program that is based on um, learning phonics and foundations first. And um, one, one thing that's really interesting to me anyway, is the fact that our brains were not wired to ever learn how to read. So um, we have this code that we have to decipher and, um, and figure out all the meanings. So we're, we're wired for speaking, but we were not necessarily wired for reading. So for a child to learn that code, um, it's really, um, it's kind of a big and cool deal that, um, that they do. So, um, so yeah, it's very important for us that we are um, reaching those very basic foundational skills and building on those. And we even do, um, we even do um, foundational work, even in the upper grades where we talk about the morphology of words. So we're studying Greek and Latin roots and um, uh, prefixes, suffixes, and things like that that are gonna help our students later on in uh, middle school with their science and history courses. The next question is, how do I get my child interested in topics to read? Okay. So yeah, so that one can be just a little bit tricky, but um, because um, I had one of those that would pick up a book and not be too interested in it after a page or two. I would try to uh, focus on things your family are doing. So if you're a family that camps, then um, use those resources or even just Google uh, children's books about national parks. Um, Google can be your best friend here. Um, I, I think that if we try to push things on them that they're not interested in, then they might not buy it. Um, and then it might take us reading with them for five, six, seven pages um, until we let them uh, fly with those texts on their own. Um, and that's fine, that's perfectly fine. Um, I, I, just, I just think that um, they will, um, they will be attracted to things that they uh, they like. And then again, going back to the idea of the, of the book series. 
that's a really um, that's a really important thing, uh, maybe to help us help a child who might be reluctant find one book uh, that's in a big series that they can really latch on to then subsequent titles. The thing about that is those texts are they're predictable and our students like that comfort. They like to know that they're going to get in and be able to sort of understand the pattern that the author has read in and um, and so it just makes it it makes it very comfortable and familiar to them. The next question is, um, what do I do if I think my child might have a reading disorder and what does the school district do to assess reading disorders and identify students with possible reading disorders? Okay, okay, that's a great one. So, well, first of all, it's our greatest privilege to partner with you in order to provide the best learning experiences for your child's success. That's really critical. Um, my best advice is to not wait uh, until a conference time to check in with your child's teacher. We do our screenings um, right away when kids get to school. Most often our, um, our screenings are completed by the second or third week of school. So I would say that after, in a typical school year, after the month of September um, would be a really good time to make an appointment, check in, and then have your child's teacher sit down with you and that um, schematic map that I showed you um, of all the different assessments and um, give you some reassurances of um, where your child fits in on that. So, and then, and then ask what kind of, um, what kind of accommodations are being made for uh, instruction. So we like to try um, anywhere from two, to four to six weeks, uh, try instruction on those skills that might be being missed. And then we do what we call progress monitor. And we see at that time if the instruction that we're providing is working. If students are making even small gains, then we know we're on the right track. Um, it's when they're not making the gains that we get a little bit concerned. So, um, so ask about progress monitoring. Um, um, if a child is not making progress, then what happens is a team is assembled. Um, it'll be the teacher, a specialist, often a school counselor, school psychologist, administrator, um, and you, of course, um, sit down and start to do some problem solving to see if any additional um, screenings need to be done that other than what have been done. So um, sometimes we, you know, do a family history, we talk about, um, you know, if you've been involved in other schools or not. So there's just a, a, a very huge team approach. But um, my first, my first and best bit of advice is don't wait with your concerns because we have, we have the data to show you. And um, if you are concerned, we can, we can hopefully help alleviate some, some worries. The next question is, um, what is the program that's used at the dual language um, schools that we have in terms of, um, it, I think it was back when you were talking about the science of reading and what type of program are you using for dual language? For dual language? Yes. Oh. That's a whole other session. Um, so the dual, the dual language um, program, because they teach two different languages and then they bridge those, they, um, they use uh, biliteracy unit frameworks um, that, that have been developed that have um, topics and themes and texts in both Spanish and English. And um, they, they have, uh, it's just a whole different animal. And um, it's really not my area of expertise, to be honest. You could contact um, uh, Sarah Del Toro in federal programs for more specifics about the curriculum there. Um, because we are teaching two different languages and one of them is English, then we do really want to make sure that they are getting, you know, all of the English foundations as well as the Spanish. But how they do that is just looking so much different because they have so much 
to do in in every day. So um, for for more on that, I'm going to have to refer you to um, to uh, Sarah Del Toro. And Matt, did you have something to add to that? Um, yeah, I would just I mean I would just echo what Liz was saying. So it is bi teaching for biliteracy is t different than teaching for literacy. Um, however, that doesn't mean that students cannot struggle with um, reading um, in the bi bi in, in the biliteracy program. And so um, we would we would definitely um, want to, we definitely do those screeners. We definitely would implement those screeners that Liz had talked about previously um, in terms of you know the the the, the primary language of the student. Um, but it is different, um, and the reading skills are different. Um, and the way we integrate the skill, the the content with reading to bridge between Spanish and English is different. Um, so there are some, there is the the acquisition of of English reading and Spanish reading is on a little bit different trajectory than it is if you were just learning one one language. Um, but the outcome overall is very positive in that you've you you you're biliterate when when at the end of of the instructional time. So. And the final question we have, Liz, is um, are there any early learning programs if um, if their child is not in school yet um, that they can take advantage of in terms of getting a head start on those um, kindergarten skills and getting ready for kindergarten? Mm, yeah, well, first of all, I would go through um, the Reading Foundation's Ready for Kindergarten program. It is phenomenal. Um, when you sign up for that program, you get a binder full of resources. Um, you get physical uh, teaching tools. Um, you get uh, lists of benchmarks of, you know, about uh, where your um, child should be with their literacy development. And I just cannot recommend that enough. So um, you can go on the Mid-Columbia um, uh, Reading Foundation website and take a look there and see when they're doing their next sessions. I think that would be really great. Um, I would also um, check with the Mid Columbia Library just on on their reading programs. Um, it's always good to and I don't know now with COVID and um, different um, um, circumstances if they're actually doing any kind of read aloud um, uh, right now, but um, it's it was always really great to take kids into the library and have them sit and listen to stories um, just because again that helps them to um, you know with that vocabulary and background building and so on um, you can make visits to the library check out books um, uh, right now i'm a big fan of not um, a lot of computer programs just because i think our kids need a little bit of a break but there are several digital resources that we have on our KSG website, um, like Starfall, and um, there, there's just a whole bunch of those, um, and we have those, we have those somewhere on the website. Um, but, um, but I would just, I would, I would, I would follow some of the things that I talked about tonight more than anything, and um, just enjoy each other's company and literature. Um, I think that's really, um, really a, a, a really special thing that you can do with your family. Great. And I would, I would also add that that um, Mid Columbia Reading Foundation Ready program is a partnership with the school district and it's free to all Kennewick residents residing in the Kennewick school district boundary. So we do yeah. advertise it. Um, it's currently an online program. Um, it's normally an in-person program, but it's been very successful um, since it has gone online. And I know that their participation has been great as well. Yeah. So that's all the questions we have. So I will pass it on to Mr. Scott. Thanks, Robin. Um, and just to echo a little bit what Liz said, I know that we had several questions around concerns about this, about your student and are they making progress and if they're having difficulty. And I think nothing can be more painful for a parent than a child who struggles to read um, because it's just it's painful for us we know it's painful for them i think the main thing to remember and i'm a parent of of, of a child who, who struggled to read is that particularly at those younger ages to make sure that we're keeping reading fun and that you're engaging them in reading because most of us know that when we 
when we struggle to do something or when something doesn't come easily to us, we don't, we don't tend to try to do it more. We tend to avoid those things that we find to be burdensome or difficult and children are no different. And so I think it's really important to use some of these strategies that Liz has outlined to keep in, in mind Scarborough's Rope, all of the different aspects that are incorporated into reading, how you can just help your child by gaining better background knowledge about topics that are of interest to those to your student. When you do that, then that opens up the world of reading to them on areas that they're very that they're very um, passionate about. And so I would just say, you know, reading is very important, but but not everybody is on the same trajectory for reading. And as Liz pointed out, our brains are not necessarily wired to learn how to read. Um, it is something that comes very easily to some students and something that comes very difficult to others. And so um, just do foster that love of reading and, and make sure that we don't put too much pressure on your students when they are struggling to read because that, that does sometimes have the opposite effect of encouragement. So, um, but these are all great strategies. I really appreciate Liz and her expertise um, and what she's provided to all of us tonight. Um, with that, we will close it out. I wanted to mention that our next Get to Know Kennewick School session is, uh, is coming up on May 18th uh, from 6.30 to 7.30, where we will have a focus on math and science. So we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you very much.